Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the analysis of the facial beauty. I'm Dr. Stratich. For the past sessions, we have learned facial types, proportions, and asymmetry, mainly based on the several classical canons and rules, cephalometric and anthropometric measurements, and their normative values. In other words, we have focused what are normal or average among the measurement parameters and what factors preclude the individuals from being beauty. Was it enough to define the concept of beauty? I don't think so. Our current understanding of facial aesthetics, unfortunately, has not shown the ability to discriminate between what we find exceptionally beautiful from what is thought to be average. There still remains much to be uncovered regarding the mysteries in the beauty concept. Therefore, in today's lecture, we will have time to think again the concept of the facial beauty again, focusing on the facial point of interest and the circles of prominence. Let's begin. There is no doubt that the facial beauty has a tremendous impact in our lives, and it begins very early. The beautiful are treated and evaluated better in grade school, which is not reflected on standardized exams. This preferential treatment continues in the work environment as they are found to be promoted faster. Socially, they are 10 times more likely to get married. People judge the beautiful to be more ethical, more honest, healthier, and to have better personalities. Amazingly, even our own mothers treat us differently as babies depending on how we look. In terms of sexual selection, how is beauty propagated? We obviously choose for it when we select our mates. But Darwinian theory has always stated that function precedes form. However, there are many studies which show that all species choose their mates based on their some aesthetic elements. The reasoning is that these external features indicate the health and reproductive status of the bearer. In humans, there is a lack of definitive evidence which points to beauty indicating a healthier person. It may be that there hasn't been the right study that isolates and negates confounding factors which prove this. There has been studies showing that we do have the ability to appreciate beauty preferentially in that it is wired into our neural anatomy supporting that humans do select for beauty. The question then becomes, if we do select for beauty, is there an idea that we are selecting for? There are many studies which support that an idea exists. Logically, because there are different grades of beauty, there must be a phase that is considered to be the best. Some have theorized that culture influences what particular people find attractive and that there is no universal idea. Recently, cross-cultural studies, however, have begun to disprove this thought, hinting at an innate ability that transcends ethnic variables in facial architecture to support the basic compilation of shapes that define facial beauty. Studies showing that babies spend more time looking at more attractive people based on adult preferences also support this idea that an ideal arrangement exists. Cultural differences and preferences can also fit into the universal idea. For example, Asians and African Americans have their own unique variation that distinguish them from different ethnicities. They are accepted as the norm in their cultures, but the compilation of the different shapes of the face, their arrangement, balance, and proportion are essentially the same in adherence to an idea. These minor differences may be what heightens a particular individual's beauty by showing the viewer a unique representation within the face adherent to idea, while heightening a factor based on cultural familiarity. Despite the numerous articles on facial aesthetics attempting to find the answer for facial beauty, the ultimate qualitative and quantitative definition remains elusive. Farkas and colleagues showed in 1984 that the seminal neoclassical canons did not represent the average facial proportions 
and are a poor theory to use when describing facial aesthetics. Many other researchers agree to the point. Some believe that there exists a divine proportion based on the number phi 1.618 where the face is divided proportionally. However, faces that fit into that scheme are not necessarily beautiful. Perhaps the answer for facial aesthetics lie in the orientation of our analysis. Previous theories such as the canon have been traditionally based on horizontal and vertical planes of reference in two dimensions. The canons are the canon 1 states that the distance from the vertex top of the head to the endocanthian level of the medial cat's eye is equal to the distance from the endocanthian to mantan. Canon 2 states that the distance from the trichion to nasion equal to nasion to subnasial equals the subnasial to mantan. Canon 3 states that the distance from the vertex to trichion equals the distance from the trichion to glabella equals the glabella to subnasial equals the subnasial to mantan. Canon 4 states that the height of the nose equals the height of the ear. The distance from nasion to subnasial is equal to the distance from the top of the ear to the bottom. Canon 5 states that the distance between lateral and medial canthi is equal to the distance between the medial canthi. Canon 6 states that the distance between the medial canthi is equal to the interalar distance. Canon 7 states that interalar distance multiplied by 1 and 1 half is equal to the distance from the commissure to commissure. In this, the interalar distance means that the distance between the lateral edge of the alien. Canon 8 states that interalar distance is one quarter the distance from zygoma to zygoma. Canon 9 states that the nose inclination is equal to ear inclination. When we examine the canons, you notice one important principle. They depend on external landmarks that may play little or no relevance to the observer who encounters a new face. When people interact with each other, they spend very little time incorporating the hair lines or subnasal into their assessment of beauty. Theories based on elements unimportant to the observer's visual attention will ultimately fail. In order to find the answer to facial beauty, we need to base a new theory on what the observer concentrates on when they analyze face. If possible, we also need to incorporate our analysis in three dimensions. With this seminal piece of knowledge, the specifics of the theory can then be deduced. Until now, we have met numerous reference points and line or planes. However, judging the facial proportions and aesthetics utilizing internal and therefore invisible reference points, lines, and planes are not employed frequently. The inclination of the anterior cranial base, geometric center of pituitary fossa, and other invisible references utilized in many cephalometric analyses plays a small role in the clinical decision-making process. So, more importance and emphasis is given to describing the points, lines, and regions of external, so visible part of the face together with the tissues that are under the skin and act as support structures. The next issue we will discuss is dedicated to how any observer, not necessarily a professional, identifies and studies the facial points. Studies of eye movements during visual perception provided information concerning the nature of internal representations of objects in the memory. Eye movements are necessary for a physiological region. Detailed visual information can be obtained only through the fovea, the small central area of the retina that has the highest concentration of the photoreceptors. Therefore, the eye must move in order to provide information about objects that are being inspected. When the retinal field is mapped onto the visual cortex, there is a considerable geometrical magnification of the signals coming from the fovea and the consequent reduction of signal coming from the periphery. In about one second, we are able to fix two or three regions of interest. 
that means the ROIs, which are also called significant points of fixation. A rapid eye movement requiring a very short time period connects the one ROI to the next. We know this from the work of the Albert Yarbos, a Russian psychologist active in 1950s and 1960s. He developed the first apparatus that could track exactly where people centered their eyes as they looked at a photograph. The movement of eye fixation made while viewing simple drawings indicate that these ROIs correspond to the angle of the figure. Other studies added the points of maximum curvature at the so-called unusual details and unpredictable contours to the previous significant point of fixation. Knowing this spontaneously selected ROIs facilitates clinical facial analysis as it helps in distinguishing what is captured during our visual perception from what is not. It provides some facial points that can be considered more important than others. It permits the excursion of some facial points utilized in previous analysis, as they are not detected as ROIs with direct examination and clinical photographs. It also permits the construction of an exclusive personalized and unique approach to each clinical case utilizing the ROIs. It avoids the treating a singular case by matching it with normal templates or normal values. It also helps the physician and the patient to discover and debate facial aesthetics with clinical photograph analysis. The ROIs are the same both for lay people and for the professional. Finally, it reduced the importance of the abstract forms of the analysis, such as cephalometric analysis, in planning the treatment and evaluating the result obtained. A human face is not a simple drawing like those utilized by Alfred Yarbus for his study on eye movements, but with different multiple views. It can be broken down into simple pictures. Reviewing all the figures, we can note some points and lines that are evident in one view and completely hidden in another. This simple observation proves the limitation of the classic frontal and right profile views alone and the need for multiple views. The reported experience gained in studying eye movements during visual perception offers a new path for direct and photographic clinical analysis, helping us to identify something similar to Lorenz Stark's ROI in the face. There are three basic methods to identify a point utilizing the ROI principle. Number one, search for an angle. The lip commissure, the lateral canthus, and the medial canthus are the angular facial point of interest. Number two, identify the maximal curvature point on a curve. They are divided into two subgroups, maximal concavities and maximal convexities, facial points of interest. In the profile view, the nasal radix and the labiomental sulcus are maximal concavities, facial points of interest, whereas the nasal T and labial superior and inferior are maximal convexities, facial points of interest. Number three, search for an unpredictable curve or contour. A curve could be defined as unpredictable when it changes frequently and irregularly and so, from a visual point of view, has a large amount of information. A point of this type could be identified when a concavity turns into convexity. The subnasal and the submental points are concavity-convexity facial points of interest. When two or more facial points of interest are specially close to each other, as happens in the eye and the perioral region, the relative impact on the observer is high. In the examples in the screen, utilizing the frontal drawing smiling, profile, oblique, and nasal base views, some of the classical reference points are almost coincident with the facial points of interest. However, this is not always the case, especially when this search is performed in views other than the profile. What happens to our visual perception in case of the facial deformities or aging? It is believed that the basic visual phenomena are these. 1. The presence of one or more particular or distinctive facial points of interest. 
An example of this presence of the broken dorsal line in the case of the crooked nose. Number two, the appearance of a new facial point of interest. It may happen in the aging phase when a new curved skin line is produced due to soft tissue facial ptosis. An example of this regarding the jowls is depicted in the screen. Number three, the absence of normal and pleasant facial points of interest. An example of this is the absence of distinguished nasal radix concavity as in the so-called Greek nasal profile. Number four, a change in the characteristics of facial point of interest. An example of this is the transformation of the gentle curve into a deep circus as happened to the chin lip profile in the case of deep bite dentofacial deformity or its flattening in the opposite case of an open bite class 3 skeletal pattern. Number 5. A change in the position of a facial point of interest. An example of this is the inferiorly positioned nasal radix, which makes the nose appear too short. Identifying and studying the facial points of interest can be very helpful in facial analysis and may be used to guide a treatment plan and to follow up the clinical case. Now, we are going to talk about adding lines to the facial points of interest. More frequently, the analytical value of some particular facial points of interest can be enhanced by adding a line. There are many ways of adding lines or changes. In pictures taken in the natural head position, we can utilize the perpendicular or horizontal lines passing through the facial point of interest. An example of this is shown in the screen, in which a horizontal and a vertical oriented line passing through the subnasal helps in judging the columella of the lip profile. In frontal and basal views, a line passing through the two opposite side points helps to detect the symmetry of facial region. And in all cases, drawing a line that passes through a two facial points of interest can underline a particular facial feature or deformity. Some fixed distances between points and regions can be perceived as long or short by the observer, depending on the shape and the volume of the other facial features. Typically, in the frontal view, the measurable distance between the medial canthus is not influenced by lowering or augmenting the nasal profile with a rhinoplasty procedure, but the visual effect obtained clearly modifies how the observer judges this distance. Again, in profile view, the interior and posterior surgical repositioning of the chin greatly influences how one perceives the nasal tip projection. Sometimes in the analysis of the clinical case, the mean distance in the millimeters between two points or the mean angular value in degrees between two lines should be reconsidered after studying the effects of the visual illusion sustained by the other parts of the face. With these in mind, we are going back to the story of classical canons and unlocking the answers of beauty mystery. The failure of canons in their attempts to define beauty sub supports the idea that the external landmarks that they employ are not central in humans' assessment of beauty. One basic idea in the development of the circles of prominence, COP, is that the eye and specifically the iris define all elements of the facial beauty as we will explain. With this premise, the rest of the shapes and dimensions of the face are defined. On a more simple scale, the face is an oval with multiple shapes of which the eyes, nose, and mouth are predominant. All organisms, human notwithstanding, have a strong desire for order. When one asks the population to determine their preference for the location of a circle, Within a scale, the majority of that population will choose that the circle is most desirable in the center of the square. This arrangement promotes symmetry and satisfies the organism's desire for the order. This same idea applies to the face. The shapes in the face must be arranged in such a way that order is emphasized. Finding the exact order, therefore, really answers the question of facial beauty. Another idea that is central to facial beauty is that subtlety within the face are vital to their appreciation. 
The transition from one shape and structure to the next must be done almost imperceptibly. Not surprisingly, our visual system is arranged to exactly appreciate these subtleties. Specifically, our minds identify very subtle gradations of light that helps us to subjectively interpret in three dimensions. Ganglion cells in the retina are arranged in concentric circles linked by the inhibitory pathways increasing the sensitivity of these cells to appreciate borders between light and darkness. The brain is thus highly stimulated by contrast, exactly wiring our minds to appreciate these gradations of light. In addition, because of their geometric arrangement, they possibly have a preference for appreciating circular elements as well. It is within these gradations of light where the answer to facial beauty hides, and these subtleties are also what makes us beautiful. We must see no lines, blemishes, or highlights that deviate from this collection of shapes within our face that determine our aesthetics. We must see only gradations of light that demarcate these specific shapes, and these shapes must be in balance, must exude symmetry, and must be in equal proportions. These gradations of light, ironically, may also be underlying reason why beauty has remained such a mystery. In the past, we have relied on the saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But there existed all along some basic arrangement of shapes through which minor variations in millimeters endowed uniqueness to that particular face. These minor variations in combination with the subtleties of shading are the elements that have precluded us from identifying this beautiful arrangement. In addition to this hindrance supplied by the gradations of light, beauty is appreciated preferentially in the light hemisphere which is separated from the analytical left hemisphere. Coupled with this finding that beauty incites a predominant emotional response in the limbic system and the subconscious realm, along with the findings that beauty is appreciated at all levels of the brain, the conscious and the analytical part of our mind was further kept from the discovering the answers. Okay, we are now talking about the circles of prominence, a new theory on facial aesthetics in more detail. Previous work have shown that there is a hierarchy of interest for the observer when assessing a new face. Studies based on recording of eye movements showed that a person fixates first on the eye, nose, and mouth than other external landmarks, but returns again and again to the eye, nose, and mouth. Specifically, the observer fixates the most attention on the iris. The circle of prominence, briefly COP, is based on this vital finding. Importantly, this theory is based on a frontal view in three dimensions by incorporating subtle shading, which brings the element of depth, all shapes, sizes, and dimensions in the face, which are delineated by subtle gradations of light, are defined by the iris and specifically the diameter of the iris. The width of the nasal dorsum, the diameter of the nasal tip highlights, the diameter of the partial circle formed by the A layer, the width of the lower philtrum, the distance from subnasal to upper lip, and the height of the lower lip. All should be equal one iris width. This is considered somewhat logical because every shape or distance on the face has its own existence and there must be an ideal size for each of them. Incorporating mathematics, the values zero and infinity helps us to make sense of many things in nature. So it does in the face. Because we spend so much time focusing our attention on the iris, the brain prefers the size of the iris as the ideal median between zero and infinity through which these structures are defined. When the diameter is greater, the attention is drawn away from the iris and other structures that are ideally on iris with it and towards the larger structures. The ultimate result is that the beauty of the iris and eyes are decreased. When the structure is smaller, less attention is brought to it. Hence, it is better for the structures to be smaller than an iris with it. However, the smaller the shape is from the iris, the less association with other structures. This inequality detracts from the harmony promoted by having all of these shapes equal in size. Hence, the more equal shapes are to one iris with it, the more aesthetic. 
for the palpebral aperture, the greater exposure of the iris, the better, but it should not exceed the superiorly past one or two millimeter inferior to the superior margin of the limbus and inferiorly below the lower limbus. Crucially, the iris, nasal tip, and lower lip are the primary COP. They are the most prominent structures within the eye, nose, and mouth units. To bring more ideal balance and proportions to the rest of the face, all of the subsequent larger COP and shapes that emanate from these primary COP should be based on multiples of the iris widths. This is also logical because as these shapes increase in size, the distance that separates these larger COP from the smaller COP also has an idea that exists between the infinity and the zero. Again, because we spend so much of our time focusing on the iris, it is logical that the iris with this serves repeatedly as the width which the brain finds ideal. Because progressively larger COP emanates from these structures, the distance between the primary circle of prominence should be equal to maintain balance. The most important distance is from the pupil to the midline, specifically from the center of the pupil to the limbus, from limbus to the caruncle, from lateral edge of the caruncle to the medial edge of the canthus, from canthus to the lateral edge of the nasal side walls, from side walls to lateral dorsal edge, from dorsal edge to midline are all one half an iris with its lengths. Each of these distances have their own existence and thus must process an ideal. Because they are not primary in their importance to the beauty of the face, they are defined by the one half the iris with its. The distance totals a three iris with its. In turn, this defines the distance between other primary circles of prominence. From the pupil to midline, from the horizontal level of the pupil to the center of the nasal tip, COP, from the nasal tip to the center of the lower lip, COP, and from the lower lip to the mentum should all be equal to three iris widths. The mentum serves as the lower boundary of the face. When these distances are unequal, they bring progressive tensions to the circles that emanate from the first and primary COP in their relation with the neighboring group of COP. The result is that a decreased aesthetic value is placed on the observed by the observer. In other words, the main shapes within the larger oval shape of the face are the eyes, nose, and mouth, and this description details how this balance between these major units is achieved to satisfy the observer's desire for order. The next phase of the theory deals with three oblique lines that an observer visualizes. The first oblique line traverses from the central nasal tip COP through the pupil. The first oblique FO line then centers or COP in the lateral upper lid. Although not a definitive circle, it is a height from the upper lid crease to brow is approximately one iris with this. The FO and the highlights of the nasal tip and the lateral upper eyelid highlight bring attention to the eyes and iris. The arch of the eyebrow is really an evolutionary thinning of the lateral portions of the eyebrow to reveal the lateral eyelid highlight the above upper eyelid crease. The effect of the highlight is important to the beauty of the eye. The lateral upper eyelid highlight stands out because the midline and the medial upper eyelid have a darker shade. It adds to the association dictated by the first oblique line and through the prominent highlighting attracts significant attention to the iris. The second oblique SO courses in a straight line beginning at the center of the lower lip and is parallel to the first oblique line. It demarcates the upper limit of the cheek shadowing and the top of the superior helix of the ear. The third oblique line courses from the mentum and is also parallel to the first two and should demarcate the inferior border of the lobule. These defining limits are the new thoughts on the where the ear should be located as far as revealed in the literature and how it symmetrically harmonizes with other structures within the face. These oblique lines and the cheek shadowing, nasal tip, iris, 
lateral brow highlight, lower lip, and mentum. By doing so, a sense of harmony is achieved through the symmetrical alignment of these structures. The obliques, specifically the second oblique, also allow certain dynamics within the face to further accentuate this harmony. When we spy the commissure are pulled up by the zygomaticus major toward the top of the ear, this is inherent in the origin and insertion of this muscle. As the lower lip stays essentially at the same horizontal level, the commissures are pulled in line with the second oblique giving this part of the face dynamic symmetry, further increasing the beauty of the face by accentuating the second obliques and in turn the other obliques. Further adding to these obliques are the vertical lines of the shadowing that should bisect the pupil. As the flat portion of the central forehead takes a sloping posterior course, a vertical demarcation of shadowing is produced that lines up with the pupils. This effectively brings more attention to the iris. The dental arches and their posterior course should also bring vertical shadowing within the cheek that is in line with the pupil, again bringing more attention to the iris. It may be that the development of the sinuses aid in forming these vertical lines of shadowing as part of the evolution of the facial beauty. This vertical plane, second obliques and third obliques together demarcates progressive shadowing of the cheek to further direct attention toward the central area of the face delineated by the circle of prominence of the eye, nose, and mouth. These vertical lines also tangential to the main lip unit at the nasolabial and the mentolabial folds. The circles of prominence then takes on another more subtle level within the eye unit. After the first COP, the iris, the second eye COP is delineated by the shadowing created by the upper eyelid crease, lower lid prominence produced by the pretarsal muscular bunching and the medial and lateral canth eye. Although the shape is more elliptical, we will refer to these ellipses as circle both in the eye and mouth. The upper lid crease and the shadowing below it extending to the lid margin should be one half iris width. The distance from the upper eyelid crease to the bottom of the brow should also be one half iris width, except in the lateral lid. As you approach the lateral portion of the eyelid, the space between the upper eyelid creases to bottom of the brow increases. The superior orbital rim as the highlight and should be about one iris width above the lateral up upper eyelid crease, whereas the distance from the crease to brow in the middle and Medial third is one half iris width. The upper eyelid, ciliary margin to the brow above and medial to the pupil is thus one eyelid width in total. And this height is increased to one and a half iris width as one approach the lateral upper eyelid highlight. The crease should stay half iris width from the upper eyelid ciliary margin to the medial to lateral tapering towards the medial and lateral canth eye. The lateral eyelid highlight is not necessarily at the lateral canthus. It is dictated more by the first obliques and then the balance that this certain line brings to the nose and eyes. Hence, this theory answers the age-old facial plastic question on where the arch of the eyebrow should lie. The arch should accentuate the lateral eyelid highlight in such a way that the highlight is in line with the first oblique. The result of this promotes Harmony between these structures. The lower eyelid should have a shadowing one half eyelid with this extending below the margin. In short, the second eye COP is two eyelids with this high and three eyelids wide, delineated by the upper eyelid crease and shadowing extending below it to the lid margin, the lower lid shadowing, and the two canth eye. Geometrically, the dimensions of the second eye COP is logical. The two eyelid width and three eyelid width wide dimensions is an ellipse with radii one eyelid width centered at the lateral edge of the iris. The same principle applies to the third eye COP. Likewise, the theory explains that everything in the face is related. The largest circles of the prominence, the fourth circle of the prominence of the eye and mouth are equal to the interpupillary distance and half face width. 
and the angle of the medial and lateral eyebrows, nasal tip to ala and lower lip to commissure are the 18 degree. The angle of the horizontal palpebral fissure is 9 degree. Everything in the face is related by shape, size, and angle. Within the nose, a theory must be quantifiable in order for surgeons to apply it in the operating venue. On frontal view, the tip should have four landmarks, two tips in defining points and supra tip breaking point at the columella lobula angle. These points should demarcate two equilateral triangles. If they do not, it should be ascertained why and tip modification can be carried out to correct the discrepancies. A vertical line drawn through the planes of the upper lip should then divide the nose equally from this plane to the ala base plane distance B and from the upper lip plane to the plane through the tip defining point. This will indicate the projection of the tip and whether an increase or decrease is indicated because the distance A should equal B. Chin projection should be 3 mm posterior to the upper lip plane. Another way to determine the adequacy of tip projection is measuring the distance from the tip defining point to the radix. The radix means the nasal length and the tip projection from ala cheek junction to the tip defining points. The ratio of nasal length to tip projection should be 1 to 0.67. The ideal nasal length from a radix to the tip defining point RT should equal stomion to mentum or 1.6 times to TS tip to stomion. Tip rotation is determined by the drawing a line through the upper lip plane. Another line drawn from the anterior and posterior points of the nostril forms an angle with the upper lip line. This angle is ideally 95 to 100 degree in women and 90 to 95 in men. On another angle exists called the columella lobula angle, which is formed by the junction of the columella and the infratip lobule. This is ideally 30 to 45 degree. From warm size view, the nasal base should form an equilateral triangle. The ratio of the columella to the lobular portion of the nose should be 2 to 1. An important term for nasal analysis is mid-face height. That is MFH, which is the distance from the glabella plane to ala base plane. Lower face height, LFH, is the distance from ABP, ala base plane, to mentum plane. MFH equals 3 mm less than the LFH. The ideal nasal length, RT, radix to the tip defining point should be 0.67 multiplied by the mid face height. Nasal tip projection should be 0.67 multiplied by RT. Ideal radix projection should be 0.28 multiplied RT, the distance from corneal plane to the radix plane. Although much of these ideas are based on the canons which have been shown to be incorrect, these aesthetic values are adequate for determining surgical maneuver based on years of ad hoc experience. However, these ideas again are based on the external landmarks which observers find less important. The ideas for the width of the dorsum and the tip have been loosely determined to date. Our only real approach to this is that the dorsum should be outlined by two slightly curved divergent lines extending from the superciliary ridge to the tip defining points. As stated above, because we concentrate so much of our time looking at the iris, it logically serves as the idea for these values. The ala and their shape and size have not received adequate attention as well. This theory states that the ala are ideally circular in appearance from on frontal view and that they should subtly emulate the iris. Instead of following dogmatic values to determine the nasal length, the balance between the horizontal pupillary plane and the center of the nasal tip should ideally three iris widths. The start of the nasal length should be where irises horizontally line up at the top of the nose. This ideal location for the radix at the horizontal plane through the top of the irises is logical because it connects the nose perceptually with the iris along 
with the angles of the eyebrows and peripheral fissure as stated before. This connection allows the viewer to naturally proceed from the eyes to the nose and then the mouth. In terms of the tip aesthetics, from the center of the nasal tip to the bottom of the nasal tip, COP, the distance is the half iris with this. The super tip breakpoint is really a depression that emphasizes the tip is half iris with this superior to the center of the nasal tip COP. It is a half iris with this from a lower edge of the nasal tip COP to the subnasal. From the subnasal to the upper lip distance is one iris with this. From the roots of the nose to the base, top to bottom, it should be widened from two iris with this to three iris with this. It is half iris with this from the lateral edge of the side wall to the lateral edge of the dorsum. The dorsum is one iris with this. The ala are one iris with this and the tip is one iris with this. Which in horizontal dimension add up to the sum of three iris with this. Today, I introduce to you a little bit peculiar novel theory about the beauty concept. The theory is subtle because it is based on the shade of lights. It is based on the most important structure on the face, the iris. Simply put, there are multiple shapes on the face and an evolutionary force must have determined the specific size of each of those shapes. Extremes in dimensions are unesthetic. Between the extremes and idea, must exist which the mind settles on and prefers. The iris is the center of attention in the face and should therefore be the structure on which every dimension on the face is based. This is the main premise of this theory. Since our current understanding of the facial aesthetics has not shown the capability of discriminating between what we find exceptionally beautiful from what is thought to be average. Previous theories such as Leonardo da Vinci's neoclassical canons and others have concentrated on external landmarks on the face, which people place minimal importance on what assessing the beauty. A new theory should concentrate on what people find important when they look at someone other's face. The circle of prominence, a new theory or new concept on facial aesthetics finds that the iris is the most important element within a face when people assess for beauty. Every shape or distance within the face has an idea from zero and infinity. Because we spend so much time concentrating on the iris, it is logical that this idea is the widest of the iris. After establishing this, the rest of the elements of the facial beauty becomes more easily to elucidate. A more accurate theory on facial beauty will allow us to improve our patients' lives for the better. However, this theory also have many disadvantages and left much to be validated further. So please bear in mind that there is no universal rules regarding the beauty concept. Okay, this is the end of today's lecture. Thank you for watching. See you next week.